Yeah, we have with us here Dr. Shreyas Ramamurthy, one another young leader who is a consultant, cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery from the Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals. He is going to speak to us on intracorneal ring segments, how and where. Yeah, can you please start your share? Uh, thank you so much, madam, and I thank everyone at ARC for having me over. Uh, as far as postgraduate uh, teaching goes, somehow in uh, intracorneal ring segments, not much has changed in 10 years. And, uh, but still, it's a kind of a favorite uh, theory question to be asked in latest uh, or recent advances uh, part of the paper. And I hope uh, the postgraduates find it useful. So the way I'm going to approach this talk is to talk to you briefly about the mechanism, uh, take you all through how we do the procedure and the planning which goes behind it, very briefly share uh, some results, how we combine it with other techniques and some complications as well to finish up with. So the ICRS is nothing but PMMA segments and uh, what they generally do is just flatten the central cornea. So the original indication for which intracorneal ring segments was made was for myopia. But after the advent of eczema lasers and reliable eczema lasers, uh, this then shifted on to treating ectatic corneas like keratoconus, PMCD, and post lasik ectasia. Uh, a prerequisite is to, however, have a central clear cornea. Whenever you have a scarring, apical scarring, you're better off doing a dark than doing an intax. Uh, again, patients who are not very tolerant to contact lenses would benefit from intax, as we must remember that in keratoconus, contact lens continues to remain the best uh, treatment option. Uh, generally, we use between a keratometry of 46 to 60 diopters. Beyond 60 also, we've done few cases, but the amount of benefit that the patient gets from the procedure is a little limited. As far as pachymetry goes, you need about 450 micron thickness at the 6 millimeter zone or at the zone of implantation. BCBA, generally patients who have very good BCBA uh, do well with just spectacles and cross-linking, or you could do a more recent uh, topography guided ablation. Uh, patients with a slightly lower vision, somewhere between 612 to 624 or 636, would benefit from intacts. Anything less than 636, you're better off either fitting them with a scleral contact lens or doing a dark procedure. These are just rough guidelines and not uh, written in stone. Now, how does intacts work? So intacts, what it basically does is it acts like a tissue spacer, as a passive spacer, where it is actually increasing the space at this area, causing a kind of a, like a mid-peripheral bump here. And by causing this mid-peripheral bump, it is flattening the central cornea. And by flattening the central cornea, and uh, we are able to bring down the uh, spherical equivalent. And also by using different ring segments, as I will talk to you all in the subsequent slides, is you can also alter the cylindrical effect as well. So it, there are different types of rings available. Intax, Kera ring, Ferrara ring, and Mayo ring are the ones which are uh, commercially available. Uh, I will restrict most of the talk to Intax. But the other ring which is commonly used is the Kera ring. Now, the Kera ring is available in a wide range of arc length. Intax previously was available only as a 150 degree arc length segment. Now you have 90 and 130 as well. It's a hexagonal in cross section. A main difference you need to know is that the Kera ring is implanted closer to the central optic zone, five millimeter zone. The advantage is that it gives you uh, a greater effect. So anything which is applied uh, closer to the center of the cornea has a greater uh, refractive effect. Uh, however, because it is also close to the uh, central optic zone, in a mesopic pupil, it can lead to more uh, glare and other uh, photic phenomena as well. Now, uh, in as far as the planning and choosing the segment goes, there are four main considerations. One is the preoperative spherical equivalent. Then we look at the location of the cone, whether it's a centered or decentered cone. The magnitude of asymmetric astigmatism, there's amount of IS asymmetry. And based on which we decide the number of rings, the thickness, and the arc length. So I'll quickly take you all through this. Now, the spherical equivalent in this table gives you a rough guide of the thickness of the ring which you need to use. Intax is usually put in the 7 millimeter zone. You have Intax SK, which stands for severe keratoconus, in the 6 millimeter zone. Nowadays, predominantly, we switched over to using the Intax SK. Uh, and uh, these are the corresponding thickness of the ring segment which you use as the spherical equivalent keeps rising. Now, location of the cone is important in deciding whether it's centered or decentered. So how do you know whether it's centered or decentered? So we look at the posterior float. And on the posterior float, 
if within the central 3 mm zone that is 50% of the cone is within the central 3 mm zone then it's centered if greater than 50% of the cone is outside the central 3 mm zone then it is a decentered cone so let's look at this with a couple of examples now why do we need to know it's centered or decentered because in centered we use symmetric ring segments that is in this particular case as you can see here just one second i'm sorry yeah so in the centered uh, this thing you use, use symmetric ring segments where the superior and inferior rings are of the similar thickness in asymmetric you use uh, that is in decentered cones you use asymmetric segments where the inferior segment is thicker and the superior segment is thinner so first you have to also look at the incision where you need to place for, for before inserting the intacts and this is based on the axis which you get either on refraction or and along with it you also have the axis which you get on the simk value and then there are two other criteria which we follow so either you draw a line which is passing through the center of the posterior float and the most elevated point on the posterior float and you extend it on both sides this will give you the flat axis and the line perpendicular to that is the steep axis similarly in pachymetry from the center of the pachymetry map and through the thinnest point you draw a line and extend it on both sides that gives you the flat axis the line perpendicular to that is your uh, steep axis so the incision is always placed on the steep axis so the four uh, values that is after transposition what you get on your refraction on your simk and the values which you get through the like i mentioned on the posterior float as well as pachymetry should more or less correlate and this will give you the incision location why is the incision location important because based on the incision location is how you are going to place the segments on either side of the uh, incision uh, irrespective of whether it's a single ring or a double ring now after identifying the cone whether it's centered or decentered if it's a central cone we are looking more at the spherical component like i mentioned earlier so this is a cone where more than 3 mm in the more than 50% of the cone is within the central 3 mm so we look at this Uh, the spherical power after transposition so you here you have a spherical power of minus 8 and as you can see here you go back to the table and you use symmetric because it's a central cone and a spherical power is what you look into when you're looking at symmetric lens segments and somewhere of minus 8 to minus 10 use a, a segment of 450 microns greater than 10 you can even do 500 microns but of course the peripheral thickness should also be a little higher now in this subsequent example you can see that the cone is more decentered more than 50% is outside the central 3 mm zone when it is a decentered cone after using the same steps for identifying the incision location you then look at the cylindrical component in decentered cones now the cylindrical component even after transposition as you all know will not change so in 3.5 is what is there in this particular case example and you again go back to that table which i showed you earlier in asymmetric segments and a power of between 3 to 5 diopters of cylinder as you can see here the thicker segment goes inferiorly and the thinner segment goes superiorly uh, essentially the inferior segment goes towards the area where the cone is decentered and obviously in keratoconus in most often uh, the cone is uh, decentered inferiorly and therefore the the inferior thicker segment will go inferiorly and the superior segment will be thinner now moving on to a little more about uh, talking about single versus double ring now a double ring that is where two rings are placed symmetrically there is a greater reduction there is a global effect and there's a greater reduction in the spherical equivalent where do we use this single ring now essentially if there is a very high isi symmetry essentially you want to just push the cone more towards the center then you can use a single inferior ring and this is actually like as if there is no ring at all superiorly we saw earlier examples in a decentered cone where a thicker ring is there inferiorly and a thinner ring superiorly but when there is a very high isi symmetry you can just use a single ring inferiorly now one thing we must understand in comparison to shorter segments that is shorter arc length of 90 degree versus longer arc length uh, studies in animal animal studies have shown that as the arc length increases from 0 to 90 degree there is a great increase in the amount of cylindrical reduction that is the action is along the axis of implantation but whereas when you go beyond 90 degree the effect is both on your axis as well as the spherical on the opposite axis as well so there is a greater reduction in the spherical equivalent when you go in for longer segments so beyond One 90 minute. degree yeah 
I think I really need to rush up there. So higher superior inferior asymmetry, you have uh, a single inferior segment. There are newer arc lengths which are available, 90 and uh, 130 degree segments which are available. These, like I said, so wherever there is a higher astigmatism greater than myopia or astigmatism with hyperopia, like in this particular patient, you can use smaller arc segments which actually give a greater reduction in the overall cylindrical error without causing a great effect on the sphere. Because there's already a patient with some amount of hyperopia, if you also cause a flattening of the central cone globally, then the hyperopia will increase and thereby degrade the quality of vision. So this is the procedure itself, uh, where you, you can see this is docking with a femtosecond laser after marking the apex of the cone. Uh, this is where the channel is created using the femtosecond laser and the incision is also created. We must say at this stage that a uh, mechanical way of making the, uh, this pathway is also available. Uh, I have myself seen it only on uh, animal eyes and I have not say, seen it being done on human eyes so it's largely given up and we do it only using the femtosecond laser. Now after that you open up both the channels preferably you open one channel at a time and insert one ring and the ring is then inserted and placed one clock hour away at least away from the incision and then after that the second channel is opened up and the second ring is inserted and once the two rings are in place you then remove the epithelium, which will, will be necessary for the cross-linking procedure. And then you place a suture at the very end of the procedure. So this is the end of the... Uh, you can combine it with cross-linking. Usually, nowadays, we always combine intacts with cross-linking. You also have you know, options to then subsequently rehabilitate them, either with spectacles or contact lenses. The challenge with contact lenses is because you have a flatter center and a steeper mid-periphery. Uh, you can't use the standard contact lenses. You'll have to go for a Roske IC or a mini scleral lenses. Uh, PRK can also be used if there is sufficient thickness to reduce the amount of residual refractive error. But what is more useful is a phacic intraocular lens, where if you have now centered the cone and the patient has a better, best corrected visual acuity, after 6 to 12 months of stable refraction and topography, you can go ahead with a toric uh, phacic intraocular lens. Uh, these intraop complications like segment decentration, false passage, perforation are uh, more with the mechanical type of uh, creating the channels. You don't seldom see it with femtosecond laser. But what you see are these post-op complications, especially if you've had a segments placed too close to the incision or if you had a loose suture. Now, the loose suture can abrade, cause epithelial breakdowns. And these are, again, keratoconic guys who have a component of allergy as well often. And this can attract vessels. And these vessels can grow into the channel and can cause uh, breakdown of the local tissue there. As you can see here, you can have a sterile uh, necrosis, and then that subsequently causes extrusion of the segment. Rarely, you can have infections which require removal of the segment and needs to be treated appropriately. You also have an innocuous complication like these deposits around the channel, which is quite common. Uh, either lipid or calcium is uh, what has been found out, and uh, no real treatment is required for it. So in Conclusion, this is only device which is capable of shifting the cone from a peripheral to a more central location. Uh, careful case selection and meticulous preoperative planning uh, and with combination of different techniques can give you optimal results in most of these keratoconic patients. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Shreyesh, for an excellent talk. I had some questions for you, but uh, your talk itself has answered it all. One question for Sharon. Sharon, are you there? Sharon, you are there? Yeah. Do you feel that cross-linking has still got a role to play when you're treating high refractive errors and you are wanting to use it to address regressions? Or do you use it only for borderline uh, suspicious topography? Um, as of now, we, we use only for uh, suspicious topography, not to treat a regression. But yes, there have been, I mean, we've seen literature there and I'm sure any, everyone may have an experience on that. But we use it only for the you know, suspicious or those kind of cases. Uh, Shreyas, you have anything to add on this? Uh, on whether, I think uh, uh, extra procedures itself, I think uh, after the advent of fake intraocular lens, whenever we have even the slightest doubt, I think we are very comfortable using fake intraocular lenses for all kinds of uh, cases, even the lowest refractive errors. And uh, that's an excellent option. Possibly just uh, nowadays, at least my uh, only thing thought for using an extra procedure is if you have a borderline pachymetry and you want to 
do a low myopic error and you don't want to push the patient for a fakic intraocular lens, that might be my only indication. But anywhere else where there is any ISC symmetry, anything a higher posterior float elevation, I think fakic intraocular lens is the way to go. Is Partha there? I have just one question for Partha. You're not there? He is there. He's there. Yes. Partha, if it is a, a borderline uh, uh, cornea with low anterior chamber depth and a high refractive error and you want to give a chance to the patient, would you plan uh, to do it with a uh, GAG PI in these eyes in an extreme scenario? Yeah. Borderline AC depth? Uh, uh, taking into account the angle is very important even if the AC depth is just borderline. So you, even if, if it is borderline, the angle has to be assessed. If the angle is wide open up to the scleral spur you are able to see, then an ICL can definitely be implanted in such cases. Anything? Anyone? I have, uh, I have just Anything. one question, Pitra. Partha, if you can take this question. Yeah. If there are, if there is, uh, the refractive error is not same in both the eyes. One eye it is low and the other eye it is high and one eye you know allows examined laser to be done or smile to be done would you change the procedures between the two eyes or uh, would you rather take a you know same procedure and the same procedure in both the eyes would be the option unless the patient is keen to do uh, a laser procedure if it is laser contraindicated in one eye and uh, fakic iul can be done in uh, the eye in which the laser is uh, contraindicated, both best be done the same procedure unless the patient is totally convinced that it is a very low refractive error and uh, can uh, can undergo a laser procedure. Why should it be uh, the same procedure? If it's a small refractive error in one eye, you could do a laser vision correction. No? Yeah, that's, so, that's so would you do a PRK in one eye and smile in the other eye or a PRK in one eye and LASIK in the, LASIK in the other eye or... <laughs> Plastic in one eye and ICL in the fellow eye. Yeah, it can be done and we can do it all. We have been doing but, yeah. but if it is just a very uh, small range between the two eyes, say a uh, minus six in one eye in which a laser vision correction is possible and minus eight in the other eye in which it is not possible. So in such a case, both eyes best undergo the same procedure. However, it is just one in one eye and a laser vision correction very well possible can be um, mixed and matched. But Chitra, can I just uh, yes. take yes. a minute? If yes. it, you, yes. if yeah. uh, Ma'am, I think, uh, no, I don't have a question. I just wanted to, uh, whoever the fellows and PGs who are listening here, I think uh, one of the most important uh, take home point from this session is uh, uh, there is nothing called as in the syllabus or out of syllabus. Uh, as uh, when I was a PG, I used to listen to uh, Titra Ma'am, Namrata Ma'am, I'd come to AIMS as a PG student also. At that point of time, I'd never seen a keratoplasty, nor uh, Ma'am was talking about LASIK at that point of time, and she was talking about DSEC, and that those were not even the words, and we didn't have a uh, YouTube and other things. But what was, what was important is it inspired people like, uh, like me, uh, and to see that at one day, you know, I can do one of those procedures. Uh, I think at this platform uh, for the PGs and everybody else, if it goes to a subconscious mind, there is something called uh, what an intax is. Fantastic talk by Shreyas and uh, uh, people like Sahil, Shreyas, Pooja, Chaitra, all of them. See, all you need is it has to go to your subconscious mind that something like this exists. I'm sure we, it, let's be very clear, we cannot teach postgraduate answers in this platform. There are beautiful test books written by some of you. Ma'am has, Namrata Ma'am has written books. I'm sure reading is the best way to pass an exam. I think what you created, Dr. Chitra Ma'am, is created <coughs> a platform to inspire. And uh, I think this is what I think uh, Dr. Uh, Rupal Ma'am mentioned. It is not possible to learn smile or intax or anything in this platform. See, I, in that way, I think, and congratulate the entire team, you, Dr. Anaga, and the entire team, to create a platform for inspiration. What I want to tell PGs, if you're not understood a single word of what uh, Sahil said or uh, Sean said or Pooja said, it doesn't matter. But somewhere there, it remains in the subconscious mind. And I'm a proof of it that when I came back from 
where uh, St. John's had sent to uh, Ames for some, and I came back and I thought, I, I know two words. Mm -hmm. There's something called DSEC, there's something called LASIC. And that it was is enough. And it was, and I, when we went back and checked the test book, there was no PubMed then at that point of time, which was good like this. There was nothing in test book. So all I, all I say is that I'm, I'll just take a few seconds is that this kind of meetings, I think is wonderfully well. And even though it, topics don't look like the question paper topics, I don't think PGs are very smart. If you look at every PG has their own portal. I have two postgraduates in my own, sorry, fellows in my own hospital who have their very, very strong own portal for how to write an exam and every question is written there. So I don't think they need us, but this platform, like even the last talk and Dr. Partha Biswas talk just inspires. I think that I think has to be the take home point because these kind of meetings cannot be, be uh, used for writing an exam, but to more of inspiration. I think Dr. Chitra and uh, Pranaga has really given this uh, beautifully to inspire. And I, I congratulate you. This was one of my first meetings as a moderator panelist in a postgraduate one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. There was truly inspiring words. And, uh, and of course, Namrata has also always been very encouraging for our ERC event. So thanks a lot. Chitra is very, very committed, very extremely committed. <laughs> I'm sure we have learned some more and gained a lot more clarity and a lot of light on refractive surgery and its application. And this uh, amazing webinar could not have been possible without the uh, very positive energies of the expert panel, my amazing uh, ARC team, and the excellent speakers. Every single speaker, you know, I wish I would, I think I would create time to go back and hear their talks again because they managed in that 10 minutes to give us so much concise information. Our special thanks to a very capable group of speakers. And of course, thanks to Kripal and his team of AIOs, Mr. Sunil, who's in charge of the webinar and is constantly being bothered by us because of time constraint and whole lot of issues. Sai and Manjula from Numortech who have always been a support to ARC at all times. Of course, my terrific strong ARC team and my charming co-moderator Anagha. Our gratitude to Entoad and Mr. Nikhil who have remained engraved in our minds for sponsoring all our activities and each and every one of you, dear friends in these attendees for making it such a remembered evening. Thank you one and all of you. Thanks so much.